Jay Delsing spent 25 years on the PGA Tour and is a lifetime member of the PGA Tour and PGA of America. Now he provides his unique perspective as a golfer and network broadcaster. It's time to go On the Range with Jay Delsing. On the Range is brought to you by Pro-Am Golf. And good morning. Welcome to Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm your host, Jay. I got Pearly with me. Pearly, good morning. Good morning, Jay. We got spring golf and crappie fishing. I love it. Right, right. The show's <laughs> formatted like a round of golf. The first segment's called the On the Range segment. It's brought to you by Pro-Am Golf. Check us out on our social media outlets. Pearly's favorite is Twitter at Jay Delsing. We've got Facebook is Golf with Jay Delsing and Jay Delsing Golf. LinkedIn is just Jay Delsing and Instagram is... You'll have to go find that. You know, we joke about it kind of every every week, and you go through those things, and I get it, and you have to have them and stuff. I know. I have no idea on Twitter. I refuse to do Facebook. I think it's like evil. And uh, I mean, can you cut his uh, microphone? He's like <laughs> oh, a he's like a dinosaur. I, over I, here. I don't care. I just I think I'm going to win the day in in this battle in in the long run. I think all this stuff is crazy. I say we go out and play some golf. The weather's getting better. It's spring golf. It's a lot of fun, and it's time to start preparing to get your game ready for the summer. Pearl, we are doing a show right now. We're not fishing, and we're not playing oh, golf. Oh, yeah, we're fishing. And you could actually do Twitter while you're on the meet. Will you give them some religion on this thing? You can do it all while you're on the course, while you're doing the show. That's the point. I don't want to do it on the course or while I'm doing the show. I want to do the show while I'm doing the show. I want to fish while I'm fishing. I want to play golf while I'm golfing. I don't want to Twitter while I'm... Let me turn his microphone He said, get off my lawn, guy. <laughs> I know, right. Can I get off? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, wait a minute. Focus, Let's, get back. Let's get back to the show. We've got a great, one of my favorite, one of our favorite people yes. in the entire world world, Kay Cockrell, yes. a fellow UCLA Bruin. She has been with the Golf Channel since its inception. And I've had a crush on her since uh, sophomore year of college. It's good Nobody cares about me, obviously, no, but I, no. it's still there. No, And I don't think she does at all. Well, I know she does. It. That's, that's obviously the bigger <laughs> point going, but well, it's still, I'm consistent. Yeah, you are consistent. And um, let's talk about spring golf a little bit. Tough as, I, my, my when, when I talk to people about this, Hands down, the toughest time of year to play. A, because we live in this crazy weather place, the Midwest. Weather's completely unreliable. You never know what you're going to get. You'll get a 60 degree day and a, you know, and it'll snow the next day. And the golf courses are just not in that great a shape yet. And there's always a bunch of rough, John, because the spring rains. They can't cut it. Grow the grass. The ground's soft. It's still cool-ish, so the ball's not going as far, and it can really be demeaning. It can really kind of suck away some of that uh, excitement that you had to get going. That's where, I, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted everybody to think about their expectations because I'm as excited as you are to get out there. Mm-hmm. The weather is finally good. We don't have to worry about freezing our butts off so we can go out there and play, but we're, we're not necessarily even <laughs> ready to play, so to speak, because we haven't played in practice that much. So where where should people spend the time, Jay? Well, hopefully they took some of our advice with the gym in the off season, really and truly. Especially as, um, and I love the fact that you're a year older than I am, as we both in better shape. Yeah, but yeah perfect. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a debatable, but um, we both do okay. We both do <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, we do. Um, but the where so where do you start? I mean, <clears throat> if you can lower your expectations and just be grateful that you're out playing for at least a couple of weeks, at mm-hmm. least a couple of weeks. We gave some tips early in the year about what should I do when I get to the course, you know, because everybody runs from the car straight to the range. Meet, for example, hits 45 drivers and then goes He's to the first He's ready to go, baby. I'm ready. You know, <laughs> we talked about, hey, man, stop by the putting green. Yeah. Figure out where it is. Even if it's only, we said 15 minutes weeks ago, even if it's only two minutes but get a sense for what that's like because you when when you get in that mode of crashing your driver because it's it's inevitably the hardest swing we make every day it takes the most energy effort and coordination to swing that driver but then you get on the putting green and go wait a minute now i need some touch and some feel so run by that putting green a little bit first and foremost then get over and hit a couple wedges just get a feel for it and instead of hitting 15 drivers make it Five yeah. and hit some other things, some mid irons and a little short, some short stuff. The short as well. game is going to pay dividends for the whole year. The short game is going to be more consistent. I mean, a three foot putt in April is not going to be a whole lot different than a three foot putt in July 
August, etc. So you can kind of get that part of your game down. And the softness and the long rough and that kind of stuff, that stuff's going to kind of change anyway. So I, I like what you're saying. And still then, still get yourself some of the fundamentals and be ready for those conditions that kind of suck out some of the excitement yeah, for you. Make it's it hard. Tough. Look at there. Yeah. It's hard. But, but the other thing is, is here's a mental tip. Clear that mind. You've had all this time to watch the Golf Channel, to read all the mags and everything, and clear your mind. Take one swing thought to the range, to the chipping area, whatever it is, not 45. And after you hit two bad ones in a row, don't throw it out the window. Stay with it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the most important part that I can can tell you. that um, ah, It's just such a fun time of year to see all the stuff blooming and – and we get back get with back people outside. that you may not have seen. You know, sometimes we've got guys we hang out with playing golf. We might not see them the rest of the year. So we're kind of getting back with uh, with folks that way, kind of uh, locking in there, seeing what other plans and what is going on with the course, how the course did make it through the winter. Uh, there's a whole lot going on. And, again, a little crappie fishing on the side. You want to pay attention to that. Yeah, that's right. Got to wet a line. Um, all right, so that's going to do it for the on-the-range segment. Um Come back because we're going to have this interview with Kay Cockrell. And don't forget about my friends at Donahue Painting and Refinishing. If you need some work on your home, the exterior, the interior, whatever it is, we're talking about high quality, great people that will make your house beautiful. So go to DonahuePainting.com. This is Dan McLaughlin, TV voice of the Cardinals. St. Louis is one of the best sports cities in the country. We also have a tremendous history of supporting professional golf. We're excited to bring professional golf back to St. Louis with the inaugural Ascension Charity Classic, September 28th through October 4th at beautiful Norwood Hills Country Club. Legends like Ernie Els, Fred Couples, Jim Furyk, Steve Stricker, and many more will be in St. Louis. For tickets and sponsorship information, head to ascensioncharityclassic.com. That's ascensioncharityclassic.com. Are you tired of forking out the big money, all those dollars on golf balls? Well, we finally have an option for you. Let us introduce you to Sniper Brand Golf Balls. This brand new product is a Serlin covered ball that is just great to play. It's long off the driver, it's accurate with the irons, and importantly, it's soft around the green. And you know what the best part is? It's just $23.99 for a dozen. That's right, $23.99, and a portion of every sale goes back to a military or law enforcement agency. Find Sniper Brand online at thesniperbrand.com. Plus, you can follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and check out their entire line of golf products on their website, thesniperbrand.com. And don't forget to check out the Sniper Brand logo. You're going to love it. I want to take a minute to tell you about a law firm that has been with me since the inception of the show. I'm talking about Doster, Olam, and Boyle. The firm was started in 2015 by Mike Doster, Jess Olam, and John Boyle. These are three veterans of the St. Louis real estate, banking, commercial, and corporate legal landscape. The firm has talented additional roster of professionals with decades of experience to help you achieve your goals in whatever situation you find yourself in. The firm was founded on the shared goals that success has to be measured by client and community satisfaction, not just profits for the partners. These guys are involved in the community, they live in the community, and they care about the community. Since its founding in 2015, Dr. Ullman Boyle have been involved Involved in real estate, business, and corporate transactions with over a billion dollars in combined value. Their areas of practice will overlap, and the firm's attorneys will take their time to get to know you and your situation so that they can guide you and point you in the direction that you need to go. Dr. Ullman Boyle, extraordinary talent, ordinary people. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. We're all experiencing very trying times right now, but hopefully we can reflect a little bit on the things that matter the most to us, like family and community. At St. Louis Bank, we want to wish you and your family safety and good health. We're a part of this community, and we are all in this together. In such uncertain financial times, you've probably never needed your bank to step up and support you more. We know, we hear you, and we are here for you. Our banking experts are doing everything they can to help. We're offering a skip a payment to all consumer accounts for mortgage loans and home equity line of credits. We're offering payment modifications with up to a six-month deferral. Our commercial and SBA loans will be handled on a case-by-case basis to provide the best relief for each unique situation. We understand that communication and speed are essential during this critical time. 
Get in touch with your commercial banking officer to take advantage of this program. If you'd like to speak with us, you can call 314-851-6200. We are going to move through this hardship, and we're going to do it together. St. Louis Bank, here for you when you need us today and in brighter days ahead. Grab your clubs. We're headed to the front nine on Golf with Jay Delsing. The Front Nine is brought to you by the Ascension Charity Golf Classic. Welcome back. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Jay and John are here, and um, we are going to the Front Nine. Um, We've got to give a shout-out to Whitmore Country Club for sponsoring the show. They've been a great partner of mine. There's 90 holes of golf at Whitmore. You get to play the 36 that are at uh, the Whitmore Country Club facility. You also get access to the Missouri Bluffs the Links of Dardeen, and the Golf Club of Wentzville. Remember, no cart fees, no assessments, no food and beverage minimums at all at Whitmore. They have a 24-hour fitness center, a large pool complex, three tennis courts. Year-round social calendar out there is rocking. The Christmas and holiday parties are legendary. It's a family-friendly atmosphere and lots to do for your children. There's junior golf, junior tennis, swim teams are available. Uh, you got to go by and see my buddy Bummer in the golf shop. Uh, they run all sorts of cool stuff for their their members. Uh, they have golf leagues and skins games and members tournaments, couples events. They're available all year round. And then one thing they're doing at Woodmore that's really popular around the country even is this kids club where you can drop your children off. You and your significant other can go get a drink and go play some golf. The kids are with other children and well looked after. Visit them at WhitmoreGolf.com. We're going to our interview with Kay Cockrell. Kay has uh, been with the Golf Channel for as long as the Golf Channel's been around, for 25 years. She is uh, a, a former All-American at UCLA, uh, a Bruin, and uh, just a really, really uh, terrific person. We were formally walking the campus together uh, several decades ago, but uh, we'll always share the, the Bruin blood. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, I, I look at your resume and I look at the things you've done and you've done some some really awesome things. And I know, you know, part of of your gig now is growing the game. But let's just talk about UCLA and some of your amateur career. Um, you started at, you you got to UCLA in 83. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people don't realize and, and I, I tell this story, especially to young young kids, specifically young women, uh, junior golfers, or even those that are in college golf, because it's a pretty inspirational story that I actually walked on the team at UCLA. I I didn't get serious about golf till I was 15, almost 16. I played a variety of sports and, and just sort of like a lot of kids do, but I did it a little bit later, whittled it down to golf and decided that I really wanted to play that sport. But by then, I, all I was doing was playing NorCal junior golf part of the NCGA junior golf didn't travel anywhere. So I wasn't on the radar, but I was a good student. I visited UCLA on my own, fell in love with the campus, met the coach up, up at Stanford when she had the team up there for a tournament announced that I was going to try out for the team. And she said, okay. (laughs) And Jackie Steinman, who, who, who was the first coach at UCLA, she did a great job just, you know, sending me information. Well, here's the tryout dates. I'll help you get into the dorms. And, and uh, I made the team. I walked on and made the team. Yeah. And and I'll say uh, you had quite a career at UCLA um, and in in amateur golf, you're a two-time All-American. You're also an academic All-American you are the only uh, woman golfer in the UCLA Hall of Fame. And how, what a cool place to hang out with the UCLA Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah, I'm, very, I'm really proud of that. Um, obviously, you know, I, I grew a lot while I, was at, while I was at UCLA, and I just loved the environment. I loved the fact we played so many different courses like Brentwood, Hillcrest, Bel Air, Riviera. I felt like for each of the afternoons that we had those golf courses, I was a member at the course and I was highly motivated to just practice and play. And remember when we went to the IM field and just shagged our own balls. I mean, that's kind of a lost art today is going out and just hitting your own balls and pacing off the distance and seeing what your spray pattern was. And big part of that, you know, practicing with the guys, you guys on the team, trying to keep up with you all. And, 
and I really grew as a player and, um, you know, culminating with, with, uh, my senior year, actually it was right after my fourth year, I stayed five years to finish school, but after my fourth year winning the U S amateur at Pasa Tiempo, which was 20 minutes from where I grew up, it was like a dream come true. And I'd won like five or six college tournaments, but I'd never won a big national event. So that certainly put me on the map and, and was to this day, the thing I'm most proud of other than walking on and getting on, getting a spot on that UCLA women's golf team and earning a scholarship. So that U.S. first USM was was very special. And hell, Kay, you, you liked it so much you just went ahead and won it again the following year at Rhode Island Country Club. <laughs> yeah, I went to the other coast. I, I laugh and say to people, as long as I can smell the coastal breeze, I'm happy. I don't even, I don't care what kind of golf course I'm on, but I happened to win it on two pretty pretty stellar courses and, and going to the Northeast, winning it on a Donald Ross course. Um, I, I, I just had a ton of confidence, and I almost felt like I was two up on the first tee, and, and I really didn't feel a huge amount of pressure to win it again because I, I thought, heck, I've already won it. You know, I have that trophy. I have that honor for the rest of my life. Uh, no one's going to take that away from me. So I really felt no pressure to do it again. And, uh, you know, some, a great player before me, Julie Inkster had already won three in a row. She, so she'd set a pretty high standard and it wasn't as if I was doing something new. Um, so I just, you know, I just had a, I had a ball that week again. And I just, you know, how match play is so emotional and you just get on a kind of a momentum ride. And, and when your confidence grows, you become almost unbeatable in your own mind. And, and uh, I was putting during that time frame when I was at UCLA and probably winning those amateurs in the first couple of years on tour, putting was really my strength. I was very accurate, not a power player, but on, on and around the greens, I could beat you every time. You know, Kay, talk a little bit about winning champ these two major championships. And by the way, not many people have seen – what the women's u.s amateur trophy looks like but i have it it is spectacular they need to google that right away because it is a beautiful trophy it's i i know it's priceless uh you know you only get it as the perpetual trophy so you have it for a year and i had it in our house up in the santa cruz mountains i had it down at ucla for a while in the hall of fame i had it at la rinconada which was the club where i first worked at and then earned a, a junior membership and, and played and practiced at. It was in Los Gatos. So uh, it was neat to be able to share that with, with people that were a big part of my growth in the game. You know, Kay, as a player, how cool is it to win on these, these, uh, you want on uh, Pasa Tiempo is kind of a hidden gem. Um, at least in my opinion, it's an Alistair McKenzie uh, golf course and it is just spectacular. And then to go win on, on, at Rhode Island Country Club, to a, a Donald Ross uh, design. It's really important as a player to win on these type of courses, isn't it? Well, sure. And, and I think most anybody who has a USGA championship more than likely has, has won it um, or has, if they've competed in the USGA championship, have competed on some of the best courses in the United States. And, and that's what makes winning a USGA championship so important. And, um, yeah, like, I mean, that at Pasa Tempo, that was amazing because honestly, I had, I had yet to qualify for match play in the U.S. Amateur. I'd played twice before, didn't make it to match play. So my only goal was get to match play. And I had played Pasa Tempo quite a bit the, the month pre- preceding the championship because I, those greens out there are some of the toughest around. And I knew that I had had an opportunity to get out there and just really feel like, I, I knew that golf course like the back of my hand, and there's a lot of strategy that's required with playing that course. And you just can't go and overpower it. You have to, you have to play to the right spots. And uh, that was a huge advantage. Plus, I had family and friends out there. So, again, it was like that momentum thing. I, hey, I made match play. Hey, I won my first match. I won another match. And, and it was grueling. But I have to say that every single morning, this was probably the first time in my life I really truly felt this way I couldn't wait to get up and see what the day brought and if you could just bottle and capture that kind of feeling you know it's it's 
it's something you could sell for a million dollars, you know, because it, it puts you in the right frame of mind where you're going to the course and just saying, hey, let's see what the course can bring me. Let's see what I have today, and let's see if I can beat this opponent. And and it was just a magical week, a magical uh, time in my life, and, and one that really propelled me probably to have the confidence to go forward and think about a professional career because before that, honestly, I just – I just wanted to go to UCLA, get on the golf team, and graduate. And it wasn't until my senior year and and winning this U.S. Amateur that I even thought about turning pro. You know, Kay, it's really interesting. We've I had Bob Rotella on last week, and um, the 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 mindset and the 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 importance of having your mind on your side is just. I mean, you can't overestimate it. You can't you can't judge it enough, can you? No, no, you can't. And and I I struggled as a pro. I mean, I know you had your ups and downs as well. And it's it's not easy. And for me, I think I just don't know if I was ever really professional material in terms of the fact that for me the game, what I loved about golf and and playing amateur golf, junior amateur college golf, and playing on some of the teams that you get to play on um, either in college or for amateur golf was that it was a, a hobby and a sport, something that I loved to do, and, and, and I wanted to see how good I could become. But when it became a profession and it was aligned with how much money you're making, where are you on the money list, how did you finish last week, those were questions I had a hard time dealing with, and it really took a lot of the love away, and it started to become more um, – a lot. It, it was a lot of stress for me, and it didn't become enjoyable. And I always said I wouldn't – play the game if it wasn't enjoyable for me but you know the competitor inside you wants to keep trying I got to grind it out I got to figure it out I got to find a way to flip this and um you know for me it just professional golf was a struggle and thankfully an opportunity landed in my lap to work for golf channel and that kind of was was something I really needed, and I'm so very thankful that 25 years ago that happened to me. I mean, Kay, what a transition. First of all, I mean, 10 years of professional golf, but you made this this really nice transition to the Golf Channel and have been there from the very inception. Yep, since the beginning. I It's funny, I was in Springfield, Illinois at the rail. This was a longtime LPJ event, and our then commissioner, Charlie Meacham, came up to me, and I'm grinding on my three, four footers on the putting green. He goes, have you ever thought about becoming a, um, a, a television commentator? And I looked at him like, no. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it. And he said, well, there's this thing that's starting called the Golf Channel. He was very good friends with Arnold Palmer and a lot of the, the, the money and the people behind creating the Golf Channel. He said, um, they're starting next year. They're looking for commentators who are players. I think you'd be excellent. If you're interested, I'll recommend you, and you can take it from there. And it was one of those moments that you realize in life, hey, I, I've been given an opportunity, and I should pursue this. And let's see if I like it. Let's see if I'm any good at it. Let's, you know, If I don't pursue this, I'm going to regret it. And, um, and so I I was hired. They hired me. My, you know what my interview was? <laughs> <laughs> Playing nine holes of golf at Metro West in Orlando with three executives. And I was so relieved. I thought I was going to have to go into a studio and put a microphone, a, you know, headset on and a microphone. And I would have choked big time. But no, we were out on the golf course in my office. And I was relaxed and glib and funny. And I think they just wanted to make sure I, you know, looked decent. I can complete a sentence. And, and basically they hired me. You know, Kay, one of the things that we have so much in common is we both really love the social aspect of the game, right? The, the, the way the game just we can take this awesome game that we both love and use it in other parts of our lives. And when you associate money with that, it turns it into an, a completely different animal. And for you exactly. to be able to go out and let your clubs do the talking, let your game be outside, like you said, be in your office, that's a big deal. Yeah, definitely. And and that's what I've enjoyed most um, in my journey as a golf commentator. And for the most part, I'm out on the ground walking with the people, walking with the players, the caddies, you know, on the driving range beforehand, watching them, getting the stories, talking to parents or coaches. What is 
what's uh, what's been the big change? What did you notice in your child when they were small that's that's brought them to this place? I like the stories. Sure, the golf shots are important and how you hit it and the execution of a you know a, a long drive or a, a great shot out of the rough or a key putt. That's all. That's that's obviously number one. But I like to translate some of the stories, and I love the stories about struggling and breaking through. And, and that's why I enjoyed my time working on the corn fairy tour, because that, that is the epitome of, you know, what do you have inside of you that's going to make the difference to get from this spot to the big tour. And we've all gone either through those mini tours or through qualifying school. And that's the ultimate gut check. You either, you either have it or you don't. In and your case, then, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, then what do you have to stay out on said tour, the LPGA or the PGA tour? There's no doubt. And all I was going to add to that is so many times, Kay, that stuff is not measurable by watching someone swing. You've got to ask questions. You've got to hang out with them to understand that in him or her. No, exactly, exactly. And you see it it all the time. And there's some great talent that just, they, they're not comfortable on the big stage. They, they, um, they, maybe they're shy or too introverted, and um, maybe they doubt themselves, compare themselves to, to other people, and, and they shrink and end up going backwards instead of relishing the big stage and the big lights and, and wanting to do interviews and interact with the media and, and taking on sponsors and being fine with that. Um, you know, and that's the difference really. It's, it's at that point, it's really what's between the ears and, and your comfort level. Well, that's going to do it for the front nine, but, um, come right back. John's with me. This is golf with Jay Delsing. We're going to hear more from Kay Cockrell. The 100,000 watt blowtorch for St. Louis sports driven by auto centers, Nissan home of the 30 day return. WXOS and WXOS HD one E St. Louis one Oh one ESPN. Are you in the market for some new clubs, maybe a bag and the latest style of sweet new shoes. Is this the year you decide to stop listening to your buddy's advice and get some real golf instruction. If any of these appeal to you, then go to pro-am golf today. Pro-am golf has all the latest gear from all the major manufacturers. Call Steve today at three, one, four, 781-7775 781-7775 and schedule a lesson with Tom DeGrand. Tom is the best. He's been in the game for over 50 years, so you take that knowledge along with their state-of-the-art equipment and boom, your game will get a whole lot better. Visit them at ProMGolfUSA.com. USA Mortgage is doing it again. Joe Schieser and his staff have lowered rates again this month, and they will waive closing costs. If you want to refinance to get cash out, lower your rate, shorten your term, or eliminate that costly, unnecessary mortgage insurance. If you are purchasing a property, they can issue a pre-approval letter within minutes. They are the largest mortgage company in the state of Missouri, and their volume allows them to quote the lowest rates. Don't waste your time with the national online brokers. USA Mortgage is employee-owned and operated right here in St. Louis. Joe Schieser has closed over $500 million in loans in nearly 30 years in the business and over $2 million alone to Delsing's. I'd like to thank Whitmore Country Club for sponsoring my show, Golf with Jay Delsing, on 101 ESPN. Whitmore has been a great partner as I enter my second year. If you are considering a great place for your family to hang out, you've got to go over to Whitmore Country Club. Go in the golf shop. See my friend Bummer. He'll tell you all you need to know about the kids' club, the golf, the tennis. Uh, they've got uh, swim teams and leagues. There's anything you and your family could want at Whitmore Country Club. Visit them at WhitmoreGolf.com. We're halfway there. It's time for the Back Nine on Golf with Jay Delsing. The Back Nine is brought to you by St. Louis Bank. Welcome back. It's Golf with Jay Delsing. Jay and John are here, and uh, we're on the Back Nine. Uh, We're going right to the conclusion of this interview with Kay Cockrell. Kay has uh, been 25 years with the Golf Channel, uh, played on the LPGA Tour, a two-time women's U.S. amateur champion. Here she is. Kay, one of the things that's so cool is that you, you played on tour for, for as long as you did, and now you're, you've are you been such a successful um, broadcaster and commentator with the Golf Channel. What, what do you see the great 
uh, male and female players have in common that is that common thread that, that takes them and allows them to go to the next level? Well, I think it's their ability to stay in the moment, uh, a great ability to learn from the mistakes and then let them go and not let the mistakes define them, um, having good balance in their life, life and not, not having just the golf define them as well. Uh, and then out on the golf course, really being able to pull the shots off on the back nine on Sunday as if you were playing Tuesday with your friends. Um, it's not like you have to hit these extraordinary shots that are uh, world-beating shots every second. It's just executing simple shots to the right locations when it matters. And that seems easy, but it's really hard to do, as you and I know. <laughs> it's so one of the things that is so, you know, I, I try to tell people, uh, they, they, they come to me and go, oh, man, I, I'm so good on the range. I, and I'm like, guys, you're hitting into a 100-acre field with multiple balls next to you and no penalty or nothing associated with a bad swing, so there's no pressure on it. It's all about trying to do it when you need it. Totally, and you can't get there unless you have the reps. And, um, you know, I'll relate a relatively new story. Two years ago, the USGA finally created the inaugural women's senior U.S. Open, and I was exempt for it. Thank you, USGA. They gave you past U.S. amateur champs a couple years exemption. So, okay, I'm going to play in this at Chicago Golf Club, one of the greatest courses in, in the nation, in the world. Uh, what, a, what a great opportunity. But I was scared beyond measure. I mean, I hadn't teed up in a tournament in nearly 20 years. And it was crazy how my I couldn't control my body like I was hitting the I hit the ball I'm hitting the ball now probably as good or better than I ever did short game's a bit suspect you know I don't put in the reps on the putting green and chipping and all that but when I was out there competing I was such a ball of anxiety and excitement and I was hitting it far I couldn't control the distances my adrenaline was through the roof I'm like, oh, my God, it would have been nice if I had teed up in a couple tournaments before this just to <laughs> sort of hammer out, you know, some of this, um, the bio rhythms and everything that's going on inside of my body and get a sense of, you know, what part of my game is really strong and weak when, when the red light is on. You know, and that's what I tell everybody. And you have to get out in competition to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And you don't know that for sure until you have to execute a shot. And then you realize, oh, 30 yard pitch shots. I definitely need to work on those or three foot putts. I need to hammer those, you know, because they don't, they don't give them to you in USGA events. You got to hold everything out. Right. And uh, if you're like me and you're playing with your buddies at home, you're, you're not holding everything out with regularity. And, and that becomes a foreign concept. <laughs> it really does. Kate. I can remember my first time playing in the AT&T tournament. I got paired with uh, Tommy John and, um, he actually wasn't my partner, but it was in the group and his, he and his partner were moving up the leaderboard and all of a sudden he hit a wall and, and here's a guy, you know, has this famous surgery named after his arm and he was able to get out professional yep. hitters in the MLB throwing no more than 82 miles an hour. Yet he could not come close to holding a two or three foot putt under this kind of pressure because his comfort zone, this was, this was nowhere near his comfort zone. And I think as a player, You've got to get into the situations, almost muck them up a little bit to figure yourself out because you really don't know how you're going to handle them. No, you have to play. At least you have to play at home uh, where it counts, where you're playing for some money or you're playing against you know somebody for dinner or you've got a match play situation where the heat is on because that's when you, you discover what you can and can't pull off. And that's that's so important. And the other thing that people just don't realize is the professional golfers and high competitive players, you train day in and day out to to concentrate for four to five plus hours a day. And I don't know if you, you know, my attention span is not what it used to be. And I start checking out. And that's something that you just you train yourself to be focused or at least to go in and out of focus uh, in between shots. And, you know, you, you watch Tiger Woods. 
there's nobody hardly ever in the game, maybe Jack Nicholas and he come to my mind, Nancy Lopez on the women's side, who completely, 110% focused, probably Annika Sorenstam too, on every single shot that they set up to, to hit. Now, they, they're humans, and they may not execute it perfectly, but there's no doubt that they don't go into every single shot completely committed and completely focused. And that is a habit that you have to learn and ingrain into your, into your mind and your body. And that takes training. Yeah, there's no question. Kay, who was the best player you ever played with? Who's the best woman professional golfer you ever played with? Well, I was fortunate to play with quite a few when I was first out on tour. I played with Pat Bradley and Betsy King and Meg Mallon and and Beth Daniel, Julie Inkster. They were all my contemporaries, just a little bit older than me, and I learned under them and watched them. And they were all amazing. And they were the last sort of, you know, Patty Sheehan bastion of, of great American women golfers. And then um, because of the international growth of this game, the, the American players have sort of been overshadowed by these great foreign players. And I watched Annika Sorenstam and Kari Webb play at their best. And then Seiri Pak, who came from Korea and just lit the world on fire and created this whole wave of, of Asian players, first South Korean and then Asian players to come. And since then, it's just been, you know, every era has their greats. And it's so hard to compete or compare eras because everything the players are now out there doing is because of the foundation laid by everyone for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years. And you just can't, you can't compare but everyone at their, you know, our current era is every bit as good as the as the past era, um, and they all have similarities. It seems like more players have better swings, and they come out ready to play at a younger age than they used to, but that's because they're taught better younger, and they have better exercise programs and all of that. The only negative I see with the current players, both men and women, is they seem there can be a bit of they're more robotic like and they just don't seem to interact with fans as well as the old school players did. I don't think there's as much personality and and more multidimensional facets to the modern player. They're a little more single minded and one dimensional, which is great on the golf course, but it doesn't give you a whole lot, you know, of, of banter in and around just golf. You know, Kay, that's where I wanted to go next because the LPGA is growing and doing some great stuff. The women's game is improving and getting, well, it's always been great, but it's really amazing with some of the um, the new stars that are playing. Do you think the C. Repock kind of opening the door for the South Koreans has been good for the U.S. tour, for good for the game? I know that's a pro and a, there's a lot of pros and cons, but I want to get your take on that. Well, I, I think it's, it's great for the game because the goal was to grow the game worldwide. Um, that's what the LPGA and the PGA Tour have wanted. That's what the ruling bodies, the USGA, the RNA have wanted, um, even Augusta and, and the work that they've done. That is the goal. We reintroduced golf back into the Olympics. It's now a worldwide accepted sport, and that was – the goal. And with that goal, you're opening up all these countries to golf that never, never played golf before India, you know, Taiwan. When I was in um, college, we went on an Asian tour and there was hardly any players over there playing. I mean, they loved the game, but they didn't have proper programs to really grow and, and get kids introduced. China now in the next 10 years is probably going to be introducing thousands of players more thousands more players to the game no it's not good for american women's golf right now because they're being overshadowed and they need to be stronger and they need more winners but it's not bad for golf and i just think it's it's a, there's a little bit of lag time now and and the women are just going to have to dig deeper in the united states um they've been outmatched and outplayed and I don't think there's been an American Rookie of the Year since Paula Creamer in 2005. 
it's been, um, you know, players from Europe and Australia and Asia. Um, so the women have to up their game, but I'm never going to say it's bad, bad for the game because you have more people playing. You have more great women and men playing from all over the world. And that's a positive, but it is tough for the U S LPGA fan because they're not seeing the Americans win enough. Yeah. I think it's, it's true. Isn't it? When, when you look at the, the NBA and, and how the dream team won with Michael Jordan and uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and all those Hall of Fame guys went over and played in the Olympics back in the 80s. You know, Kay, I think, I think the last article I read is like 35% of all NBA players now come from Europe. And there's a similarity there. You know, those young kids and those dads and moms watched those great players play the great game of basketball and they introduced it to their sons and daughters. And I think that's what C. Repock did. And I'm with you too. It's, it's not necessarily great or easier to market the LPGA tour right now because of the language and some of the cultural barriers, but man, is it great golf. Yeah, and and they're playing all over the world, too. And that's tougher on the young American players that come out to play. It used to be there was only a small handful of overseas events towards the end of the year. But now, um, you know, right now the players are getting ready to go on an Asian swing. There's like five tournaments over there. They they go to Australia and then go go all over Asia before they come back to the United States. And it is a good thing for the tour, and it's a great thing for for um, for golf and Golf Channel. We don't send commentators and producers over there, but we get the European Asian feed, and then we show those uh, those tournaments. So at least people get to tune in and and watch, and they get to see some pretty exotic, dramatic golf courses from different parts of the world. Um, so I always I, I take a positive spin. With things, but yes, it would help if a, if a U.S. player were to win at least every three or four events, and you had a great player from South, you know, South Korea win, and a Chinese player, and a, a player from Sweden, and you you just have this great rotation, so it's not completely dominated or majority is dominated by by one country, um, and that's the criticism is too many players from South Korea that all seem very similar. And they're not similar once you get to know them. They have different personalities, and they 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 appear different. Um, but it's it you have to take the time to get to know these these young women, and that that does take time and commitment, and it's not easy for the casual fan. Yeah, really well said. So, okay, twenty five years on the Golf Channel. Oh my gosh, do you have any moment uh, in your broadcasting career where you felt? Well, either stands out in your mind or felt so privileged to be part of it. Uh, well, you know what? I'm I'm always I'm always thrilled to be at the Solheim Cups. <laughs> I love those events because they're a, really one of the marquee events for women's golf, and the galleries are tremendous. And even over in Europe, like this last time over at Glen Eagles in Scotland, and Saturday the weather was awful, but they had thousands and thousands of people they were you know five six deep and i thought these these fans are just crazy because it was so freaking cold over there (laughs) and windy and rain coming in sideways that one day um but that makes just fills my heart to see these women given this proper massive stage and they rise to the occasion and i wish they had that more often and they deserve it but i love seeing it and i think this is what it's about you know full camera coverage um, ancillary coverage, you know, wall-to-wall coverage, and people out there and the chills and the thrills. And I just wish the women experienced that more. And I know the guys get that on, you know, at all the majors, certainly, in their big events. Um, they still have some events where they have trouble drawing some crowds. like. Um, but in general, they they don't have the same the same issues that the women have with, you know, just having to try to market more and more and keep convincing people to come out. Cause once they do come out and watch the women play, they realize, wow, these women can really hit it. I mean, they don't know how far they hit it and how good they are until they see it in person. Yeah. Um, there's no, but yeah, question. you know, and then just, just things like, you know, I think of, I worked a lot of the nationwide, well, formerly nationwide now corn fairy um, qualifying, you know, the final, 
the final events where the guys either get or don't get their card by, you know, a dollar fifty two and the tears and the elation and the gut wrenching moments. I remember interviewing um Bubba and he was on the bubble and he was in and he was out. He finished early and posted a good number and he was on that twenty five number and, and that he made it and we interviewed him. I interviewed him. They used to have this big well they still do a ceremony and we used to cover it. And I interviewed him saying, hey, you've, tried, you've got your PGA Tour card for the first time. You know, what's going through your mind? And he just started bawling. Like, imagine that. <laughs> you know? It's terrific. I had to ask him yes or no questions because he couldn't get anything out. Oh, my gosh. I, I love the fact that he's he's definitely an unusual guy, but he's definitely um, – Real and I and I think that's fantastic, especially from a media perspective, because so often you get you know kind of very very canned responses. Um, you're doing so much off the course to get guys and gals on the course, aren't you? Well, I you know I always felt compelled to help with junior golf, um, and that budget service award came through me creating a program to have first having the gals on tour. I put a box out. I'm like, hey, put your old shoes and your gloves and balls in here, and let's give this, let's give the everything to junior golf, whatever junior golf program is closest to this, you know, where we're playing, either at the course or whatever junior program's happening. Um, and then I helped out with um, an urban youth program, which was the predecessor, really, to the first T program. It was for underprivileged minority kids, and that started down in LA. And I started a pen pal program to try to get some of the women on tour to hook up with some of the kids and, you know, be an inspiration. So that kind of prompted my budget service award. And I've been on the uh, board of the first T now for almost 20 years here in San Francisco. And I've got a lot of girlfriends who I played amateur college golf, even pro golf with who are coaching like at San Jose state at Cal at Stanford UCLA is physically farther for me to get back to. I help them out whenever I can, but I'll help the local, these local colleges, however I can go speak to the, to the women and answer their questions and let them see that there's other options to besides turning professional and remind them that their, their education and what they're doing as the college athletes going to, you know, be huge on any resume and remind them of those things and, you know, to try to give back where I can. We can always do more, but I think for me, helping junior golf and and young women is kind of my priority. Well, you know, I'm the dad of four daughters, and I'm I do all I can to try to get women and and young girls just to play this game. It's been so good to me. I know you feel the same way. Um, I, I also Definitely need to mention for you. that you're in the Northern Cal Golf Hall of Fame with Julie Inkster, Roger Malpe, Johnny Miller. That's some pretty heady company to be hanging out with out there. Well, I mentioned Julie earlier, and Julie, you know, grew up on the 14th hole at Pasa Tampo, but she was about four, maybe she's four and a half years older than me, so we just missed each other. We both started late in junior golf. We missed each other in college golf. But she was um, pretty nicely established by the time I got out on tour, and she was like my older sister and just was so helpful. And since my husband and I moved back to the Bay Area, it's been, gosh, it's been almost um, 23 years now, 24 years. Uh, We do a lot with Julie and her husband, Brian, and their kids. And Julie has a big, they have big celebration this year. It's Brian's 70th, Julie's 60th, and their 40th. Uh, anniversary, so they're, Man. they're celebrating all year long. <laughs> that is awesome. And, uh, Julie's one of the best people in the world, and she is such. Uh, I mean, everyone that meets her and hangs around her just loves her, and she's been so great for the LPGA. She's done it all. She's she's a you know seven time major champ, over thirty wins, Hall of Fame. She's real. She's a wife. She's a mom. She's a daughter. She's a sister. She's a best friend. She's everything. And she's so invaluable to this game. Um, I think she gets overlooked a lot, but she's really a treasure. And I, I'm proud to call her a friend. And then you mentioned Roger Maltby and Johnny Miller. I went into the NorCal Hall of Fame with them. We were all on stage together. Can you imagine sharing the stage with Roger and Johnny? You didn't get a word in edgewise, did you, girl? I 
Well, I, I was happy to just sit there and listen to their stories, honestly. But it, that was a little intimidating. But I, I, I held my own. And, and they were true gentlemen. We actually all talked together. It was really kind of like a forum. And, and we just we talked about everything under the sun. And, and those, two, those two gentlemen have been, been great mentors to me as well, particularly in the TV world, because I've worked quite a few NBC events with them over the years. So, um, yeah, that was a special moment indeed. We, I've had Julie on the, on the show, and I've had cocktails with Julie, and she is, I, I totally agree, she's one of the, the neatest, most genuine people I've ever met, and I'm so much better off to know her. And I feel the same way about you. I Congratulations, 25 years on the Golf Channel, okay, I still can't, I've got that written in my notes, I still can't believe it, and all of your awards and everything, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, Jay, anytime. It's always good to talk to you and, and reconnect. We should we should chat more often. It's like you say, it's like, wait, how many years has it been since we've seen each other? It's <laughs> right. like it was just a couple years ago. All right, that's gonna wrap up not only the interview with Kay Cockrell, but that's gonna wrap up the back nine. Stay with us. John and I are gonna break down that interview. Uh, we'll be right back with the nineteenth hole. This is Dan McLaughlin, TV voice of the Cardinals. St. Louis is one of the best sports cities in the country. We also have a tremendous history of supporting professional golf. We're excited to bring golf back to St. Louis with the inaugural Ascension Charity Classic, September 28th through October 4th at Norwood Hills Country Club. Don't miss your chance to see PGA Tour champion legends. Proceeds will benefit St. Louis area youth, including the Urban League, Mary Grove, the Boys and Girls Club, and more. For tickets and sponsorship information, head to ascensioncharityclassic.com. For the last 48 years, Pro-Am Golf has been providing outstanding customer service to the greater St. Louis area for all of our golf needs. From top-of-the-line equipment to full-service club repair lessons and instructions. They now have their own retail outlet as well as state-of-the-art computers, cameras, and things to customize all of your personal club fitting needs. Pro-Am Golf carries all the major brands. They also have the latest fashion trends from Puma Golf. Whatever your needs, Pro-Am Golf will meet them and have the best customer service in the industry. Call us at 314-781-7775 or find us at ProAmGolfUSA.com. USA Mortgage is doing it again. Joe Schieser and his staff have lowered rates again this month, and they will waive closing costs if you want to refinance to get cash out, lower your rate, shorten your term, or eliminate that costly, unnecessary mortgage insurance. If you are purchasing a property, they can issue a pre-approval letter within minutes. They are the largest mortgage company in the state of Missouri, and their volume allows them to quote the lowest rates. Don't waste your time with the national online brokers. USA Mortgage is employee-owned and operated right here in St. Louis. Joe Schieser has closed over $500 million in loans in nearly 30 years in the business and over $2 million alone to Delsing's. I want to thank Donahue Painting and Refinishing for supporting the show. When I was out playing golf, in my mind, I would see a picture that I wanted, and I'd try to hit the shot the way it was painted in my mind. The way you see your home is what Donahue Painting and Refinishing can make your home look like. Grab your friends, a cold one, and pull up a chair. We're on to the 19th hole on golf with Jay Delsing. The 19th hole is brought to you by Sniper Brand Golf. Welcome back. It's Golf with Jay Delsing. Uh, Pearly is with me, and we are at the 19th hole. So grab a chair and a cold one. I think that's what the man said, Pearly. And um, how about Kay? She is, um, first of all, a terrific lady. You and I both have a ton of respect for her. Um, the fact that she walked on to the UCLA golf team, did you have any idea? I didn't know that story. That um, There was so much good stuff in that interview. Again, like you said, because we're both fans. Uh, but that might have been my favorite story of the whole darn thing. And I think it kind of speaks to who the heck she is. Because what a, what a way to start right off the bat there. Well, yeah. And, I mean, you know, what what I loved is how um, how honest she was about when she turned pro, how she just – it. it change things for her and I can I can even relate to that I I liked it a lot more than she did so I hung in there a lot more than she did but um I can remember where it just feeling so different because there was money involved now absolutely it, it plus the lifestyle plus the level of commitment plus all of those things uh, I think we fall in love with golf in different ways and you know I can relate it's it's been hard for me to kind of regain my love for the game after quitting competition just to go out and just kind of play even for a couple of dollars just doesn't do much it was always high school I want to go play college college I want to go play pro pro I'm trying to make the tour 
And so it just took on a different thing. And it was so cool that she realized kind of early on, you know, this tour thing isn't for me, but she loved the game and she's proven that and, and just been involved in it in a different way. Well, and she does so much for the game off the course. And then she, she dis- I love the way she described the Golf Channel. This, yeah. this opportunity fell into my lap, she said. Yeah. Well, you and I, we were told uh, a couple shows ago, our first uh, uh, episode with not Golf Channel, but ESPN on golf, that was kind of the beginning when people were starting to pay, play atten- pay attention to other than tour golf stuff. It was just kind of neat. It, was, it seems like so, it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. She was the beginning of that. What were your thoughts when Golf Channel first came on? Do you remember? I was, yeah, so I absolutely remember, and I knew that AP, you know, Arnold Palmer, the king, was was the driving force behind it. And Wouldn't have happened if he wasn't there. No question about it. No question about it. That, that the struggles early on uh, needed someone like Arnold Palmer to give it the, the substance and the staying power. So you, Kay, Arnold Palmer, I mean, one of the many things you guys have in common is you guys all want to grow the game. Kay talked about that with the different groups she works with. She's on the first tee. I didn't know that for 20-something years yeah, in now. in San Francisco. Some of the things that she did were kind of precursors to uh, to first tee, so how much she's given back to the game. Obviously, you know, Arnold didn't need to do that for the finances, and I think it cost him a bundle for a heck of a long time. Maybe. I'm not sure if he ever got right with it. But if it wasn't for guys like you and and her and, and, uh, and the king, uh, there would just be less less of the golf out there. Well, so nice to throw me in anything mentioned with the King and someone, you know, that we both feel so fondly about, like Kay Cockrell. But, um, you know, when the Golf Channel first came out, um, I don't know. It was it was just odd. You know, 24 hours of straight golf. It just was, you know, and, and I'm an odd well, I'm an odd guy, period. But I'm <laughs> odd when it comes to the golf stuff because I am not one of those people until we got this show – I am so much more plugged into this than I ever was before. And it first started when I got the opportunity to work for Fox because I realized when I was playing, I mean, I was just focused on my stuff. I wasn't incredibly historical, uh, you know, in, uh, historically inclined to look at things. And, and I'm, you know, that, that's, that just really isn't, wasn't my thing. One of the things that I can relate to what Kay said was the social aspect of the game. And I still love that, John, my business, my other businesses is, is Dedicated to that. Yeah, when she was talking about, oh, I get to talk to the families and the friends and the this and that. I, I, I was laughing to myself thinking, that's so Jay yeah. right there. And yeah. that's kind of, that's cool that you guys have been able to make that transition. As you know, when we talk about this, an awful lot of players don't trans- transition to anything other than just playing. Right. And it can be kind of tough after golf because where do they go from that from that place and and you and Kay uh, have done exceptional uh, uh well, a- after that well, yeah, i mean you for, have and that's yeah. important what the heck else are you going to do that was my worry as your buddy so i'm glad you found something <laughs> well <laughs> already well, you know, always good, i can always go over there and work for you but you stopped working so wait a <laughs> no but one of the things that you know that that had always appealed to me and we've had other you know we've had ceos on the show yeah. where this game is so different than say you know, uh, uh, it's a it's a, then a hockey or a major league baseball where the careers are so short. Yeah. You know, I'm almost sixty and I'm st- I still have at least a you know a baby toe in the in the golf door because this fall baby still, you got you're yeah. going to be out there. Yeah, we got the Ascension Charity Classic coming to North County. I just Norwood Hills. It's just going to be fantastic. And this fall, depending on how this whole thing plays out, it could just be a blockbuster golf fall. Right. You know, right. if so, we'll uh, keep everybody. Uh, up to speed on that, but that's going to wrap it up. Shoot. That's another show in the books, Bradley. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was one of the best interviews I think that uh, that we've had. I'm partial because we're, we're, we're K fans, but I thought that was really neat. And what, what a sincere, uh, classy lady. Yeah, she's terrific. Um, don't forget, my friends, Bob and Kathy Donahue at Donahue Painting and Refinishing. Uh, they, they're fans of the show. They support the show. They do high-quality painting of the interior and exterior of your home. Uh, you can find them at DonahuePainting.com. And uh, me, thanks for, I don't know how you do it, keeping us in time in the studio. He's a professional. That's right. We keep forgetting he's a professional. All right, well, we'll see you next week, right? Right on. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Hit him straight, St. Louis. 
That was Golf with Jay Delsing, brought to you by Whitmore Country Club. Tune in next Sunday for more from Jay, John, and the other pros and experts from the golf world. In the meantime, you can find all of Jay's shows at 101ESPN.com as well as at jdelsinggolf.com.